Paul tells us that Jesus Christ created the universe. He not only created the universe, but he controls the universe. And he not only controls the universe, but he claims the universe. By him, he says, were all things created. Now that's not what our kids are taught in school, but it doesn't alter the fact. What we're dealing here with here is the ultimate origin of the material universe. And science knows nothing of origins. Dr. Asar Gray, once called the greatest botanist in the history of American science, once said a beginning is quite beyond the ken and scope of science, which is concerned with how things go on and has nothing to say as to how they begin. Sir Oliver Lodge, a British scientist knighted by the crown for his contributions to science in his day, stated, ultimate origins are inscrutable. Let us admit as scientific men the real origin even of the simplest thing we know, nothing, not even a pebble. And T.H. Huxley, they used to call him Darwin's bulldog always yapping at the heels of the theologians. You'd have never heard of Darwin's theories if it hadn't been for T.H. Huxley. Huxley was the man who saw the immense potential of the theory of evolution as a working hypothesis for atheism, some way to explain the universe without being bothered by God. Towards the end of his life, however, Huxley was a little more honest. He said, it appears to me that the scientific investigator is wholly incompetent to say anything at all about the first origin of the material universe. Science knows nothing of origin. It's quite easy to illustrate, you know, why science cannot speak to the question of the origin of the universe. Suppose we had a clock up here with a pendulum. And for the sake of our illustration, a scientist comes in who's never seen a clock with a pendulum before. He's very interested and uh, he makes some measurements, he observes the swing of the pendulum and how it's related to the movement of the hands and he comes up with an equation. With that equation he can tell you exactly where that pendulum will be at any given moment in the future and he can even tell you the exact moment it will cease to swing. Having tested his equation and found it accurate he decides he'd like to inquire into the past. He wants to know now what happened before he came upon the scene, and particularly how it all got started in the first place. Well, you see, for a while the answers make sense. The further back he goes into the past, the greater was the swing of the pendulum. Uh, but he discovers if he goes back too far, the answers no longer make sense. For if he goes back too far, he actually comes to a point where that pendulum was swinging in two directions at the same time, which he concludes is an absurdity. He comes to the further conclusion that uh, what is now happening does not explain how it started. He can explain the laws that now govern the swing of that pendulum, but those laws do not explain how it started. Something quite different from what is now happening must have happened to get it going in the first place. But what it is, he doesn't know. He can come up with a theory. He can say, I think this is what happened. And I think it must have happened about this time. But he can never say for sure. In fact, the only way he could speak with authority 
on how it got started in the first place would be if someone who was there when it happened were to tell him. In other words, you see, this kind of information is not derived by a process of reasoning, but by a process of revelation. And thus it is with the origin of the universe. We can measure the laws that now govern in the material universe, but those laws do not explain how it started. In fact, something quite different from what is now happening must have happened in the beginning to get it started in the first place. But what it is, the scientist doesn't know. He can come up with a guess. He can say, I think this is how it started, and I think it was about this time that it started. But he doesn't know. No way he can know. For this kind of information is not derived by a process of reasoning, but by a process of revelation. The only way we can know how it all started in the first place would be if someone who was there when it happened were to tell us. Oh, well, you see, somebody was there when it happened. The Holy Spirit was there. And the Holy Spirit tells us that Jesus Christ created the universe. There is no scientist on this planet that can contradict that statement on scientific ground. When a scientist speaks concerning the origin of the universe, he is not speaking as a scientist, he is speaking as a philosopher. He's not saying this is what we know, he's saying this is what I think. And if he's honest, he'll admit that what he's thinking today is not what he was thinking 10 years ago. And what he's thinking today probably won't be the same as what he's thinking 10 years from now. He cannot speak to the origin of the universe. Science knows nothing of origin. Therefore, we are on perfectly safe ground when we insist that Jesus Christ created the universe. That's a tremendous concept of the Lord Jesus. The trouble with most people is that their concept of the Lord Jesus is too small. You know, I had that brought home to me very forcibly a number of years ago when my boy was just a little fella about four or five years of age. <clears throat> We'd been having our family devotions and had been reading about Elijah going up to heaven in a chariot of fire. Well, I retold the story for the benefit of a small little boy and then asked him a question. I said to him, John, do you want to go to heaven one day? And he said, no. He was very definite about it. No. Well, we looked at the young heretic for a moment. <laughs> And my wife was the first to recover. You know, women are a lot more resilient than men. And she said, uh, why don't you want to go to heaven? Oh, he said, because Jesus is there. Well, the heretic had now become an apostate. <laughs> why don't you want to go to heaven if Jesus is there? Oh, he said, and he was being quite serious, he wasn't being funny, he said, well, I said, he wears a dress. You see, somebody had given him a little picture and, and said, that's Jesus, and he'd looked at the picture and he'd seen a man with an anemic expression on his face and long flowing hair and long flowing robes, and he thought Jesus wore a dress, and if that's what he was like, he wasn't interested. And already down into the mind of a four-year-old had gone a concept of Christ which was too small. And that's the trouble. We carry that mental image over into our adult life. And when we think of Christ, we kind of picture him as somebody who lived 2,000 years ago in a foreign country. But that's not the way it was altogether, you see. That's perfectly true. But that's not all the truth. 
The truth is that that same person who invaded these scenes of time stepped out of out of eternity into time, incarnated himself in human flesh and lived amongst us for 33 and a half years, was the great, eternal, uncreated, self-existing second person of the Godhead. That's who he was, and he created the universe. We're living in a very complex universe. As nobody today can know everything there is to know, even about his own particular scientific discipline. My brother is one of the leading authorities in North America on diseases of the human liver. And he told me that in his area of specialty, in that particular area of medical science, they have what they call a five-year half-life. Well, I'd never heard the expression before, so I asked him to translate it into English. <laughs> well, he said it means that every five years, half the things we now know to be true are proven false and are replaced by new theory. <laughs> That's how fast our knowledge of the universe is exploding today. In fact, I read some years ago that a doctor would have to read the equivalent of one book every hour just to keep up with his specialty. That means if you went to see the doctor yesterday, you better hurry back. <laughs> uh, you're 24 books out of date on what's wrong with you. <laughs> Very complex universe. I remember my brother was telling me one time he was at a meeting of medical men and the keynote speaker was a doctor who'd spent most of his life researching sugar diabetes, just one disease of the human body. And when he got up to address his colleagues, he said, well, gentlemen, he said, uh, we, we know very little about this particular disease. A matter of fact, he said, Every time I get the answer to just one question that I have about this disease, it only raises another hundred questions to which I don't have the answer. And when he sat down, the chairman thanked the doctor for casting so much darkness on the subject. <laughs> We're living in a very complex universe. Nobody can know everything there is to know, even about his own particular area of specialty. Still less can he know everything there is to know. But has it ever occurred to you that our Lord Jesus Christ knows every law that is known to science, and he knows every law that is not yet known to science? And he knows these laws not because he has investigated them, but because he has invented them. It was Kepler, a famous astronomer of a past generation, who after a series of 18 experiments that unlocked the secrets of astronomy, who said, oh God, he said, I am thinking thy thoughts after thee. That's all anyone can do. It's a tremendously complex universe. The mind behind the universe is the mind of omniscient genius. It's the mind of Jesus. It's not only a tremendously complex universe, it's an enormously vast universe. They tell us, for example, that there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy, just in our own backyard in space. I don't know how they know that, because nobody could live long enough to count up to 100 billion. But that's what they tell us, and presumably they know what they're talking about. 100 billion stars in our galaxy. But then the astronomer comes along and says, yeah, but you see, that's uh, just our galaxy. There are 100 million other galaxies in known space besides our own. And then Einstein comes along and says, yeah, yeah but you see, known space is only one billionth of theoretical space. 
It is no wonder that Sir James Jeans, a British astronomer, once said that there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on all the seashores of all the world. But my Bible tells me that Jesus made them all. Oh, when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he, he bled and died to take away my sin. Jesus Christ created the universe. But then Paul reminds us that he also controls the universe. By him, he says, all things consist. By him, everything holds together. You may have heard the story about the nuclear physicist that used to travel around the country lecturing on aspects of nuclear science. Well, he had a chauffeur, you see, and this chauffeur used to drive him around to all his meetings, and he'd sit at the back in his uniform and listen to his boss give the lecture. One day he said to his boss, he said, it's not fair, he said, you get all the applause and you get up there and you're the big shot and I sit in the back in my uniform. Nobody takes any notice of me, he said, but I could give that lecture as well as you could. I've heard you give it a hundred times. I could give it as good as you. Well, he said, I'll tell you what it is. He said, I'm fed up with giving it anyway. Let's change clothes. I'll sit in the back in your uniform. You get up and give the lecture. So they did, you see. And he got up and he lectured on the subject and never made a single mistake, got a thunderous round of applause, and he was basking in the glory of all this when the chancellor of the, uni of the university got up and he said, uh, we've got another 20 minutes. We'll take some questions from the floor. <laughs> Student got up, he said, sir, would you please explain why it is that the center of the atom which contains protons all positively charged does not simply disintegrate according to Coulomb's law which states that like charges repel. He looked at it. He said, that has to be the stupidest question I ever heard. <laughs> He said, if I was the chancellor of this university, I would be embarrassed that a student could get up and ask such a childish question. <laughs> Sit down, young man. I'll ask my chauffeur back there to answer it. <laughs> it, is not, uh, it is not a childish question, a very profound question. Why is it that the center of the atom which contains protons all positively charged does not simply disintegrate according to Coulomb's law which states that like charges re repel? You, you can see that. You bring the two positive poles of a magnet together, they won't stay together. By the same principle, the center of the atom ought to disintegrate. Nobody knows why it doesn't. Oh, I read uh, some years ago now that they're on the track of it. They, think they found what holds it together and they call it a glue-on. <laughs> That's right. That explains it. Held together by a glue-on. I just uh, finished reading the science page in this week's uh, Time magazine. You know, they have just built a new $600 million research center in Virginia to look inside protons and neutrons in, in the center of the atom and to study a half dozen what they call quarks. Hmm. That's the basic component of matter. 
and, and they're trying to find with this instrument the still hypothetical proposition that it is gluons that bind the center of the atom together. They still don't know. But I know. <laughs> I know what holds it all together. It's held together by the genius of Jesus. He not only created the universe, he controls the universe. All things were made by him. By him all things consist. Do you ever stop to think about the sun? The sun is losing weight by radiation at the incredible rate of 4,200,000 tons every second. It's a star. It's incredibly hot. It's constantly converting hydrogen into helium at inconceivable temperatures. But somebody set the thermostat. So that our little planet in space never gets too hot, it never gets too cold. It stays at the right average temperature to sustain life. Life as we know it on this planet could only exist within a very na narrow margin of temperature. If it got much hotter for much longer, the whole planet would become a Sahara Desert. If it got much colder for much longer, the whole planet would become a frozen arctic. It doesn't do either one or the other. It just stays at the right temperature to sustain life. Who set the thermostat? His name was Jesus. He not only created the universe, he controls the universe. When I was a bit of a boy in Britain going to school, we learned about a king called King Canute. <laughs> I noticed the look of intelligence on all your faces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a king of England, Norway, and Denmark. He was considered by his subjects to be a, a very wise king. So much so, indeed, they wanted to give him divine honors. Being a wise king, he refused to accept the worship of his subjects. He had them take his throne down to the seashore and set it up where the high tide mark was. And then he watched as the waves came rolling in. As the waters began to swirl around the foot of his throne, he stood up and swayed his scepter over the surging seas. And he said, Stand back, ye ocean tides. But the proud waves rolled on. Thus King Canute taught his subjects that he did not control the universe, but Jesus does. John tells us that the Word, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he says, thinking back over those marvelous years when as a young man he had trod the Galilean lake in the company of Jesus. He said, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One day when Jesus lived down here, he borrowed Simon Peter's boat as they shoved off from shore, he was tired and went and wrapped himself up in a boat cloak and lay down in the bows of that boat. That was his humanity, you see. He got tired like anybody else, went sound asleep. You know, that's the only time in the Gospels you ever read of Jesus being asleep. 
and instantly all hell was let loose on that lake. Simon Peter was scared to death. It says the boat was now full. Well, what happens when a boat is full of water? It sinks to the bottom, doesn't it? <laughs> Not that one. No water can swallow the ship where lies the, the master of ocean and sea and sky. But there's that boat awash with water and Simon Peter wading through the water to where the living Son of God sleeps still. Didn't bother him. He's up to his neck in water. Didn't bother him a little bit. Went on sleeping. Nothing to get worried about. <laughs> Simon Peter woke him up. He said, Carest thou not that we perish? And he stood up there in that boat and listened to the howling winds and looked at the heaving waves. And he said, Be still. And instantly there was a great calm. They said, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? He controls the universe. He not only created the universe, and he not only controls the universe, but he claims the universe. All things were made by him, it says, and for him. He claims the universe. Some years ago, when I was still on the staff of Moody Bible Institute, I was working in their correspondence school in those days. We were producing a course, a particular course, and I needed a picture of the stars as an illustration. So I went down to the, plat uh, the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and uh, asked the, the fellow that ran the place if I, I, if I could get a picture of a star. Oh, yes, he said, come on in. He took me into his office. He pulled out a file drawer and an armful of folders and put them on the desk, he said, which one would you like? They were full of pictures of the stars. I pulled out a picture of Orion, magnificent picture. I said, can I have that one? Oh, yes, he said, you can have that one. I said, thank you very much, sir. How much do I owe you? I said, nothing. Nothing. Why don't I owe you anything? Well, he said with a twinkle in his eye, he said, well, you see, uh, we don't own Orion. <laughs> now, then he changed the subject when I said to him, sir, but do you know the one who does? <laughs> <laughs> he claims the universe, every star in space, every single speck of cosmic dust, it all belongs to him. It's his. This world is his. You have that magnificent picture in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. As the Lord Jesus steps into the spotlight of eternity and becomes the center of everything, the question had just been asked, who is worthy to take the scroll and un? Loose the seals thereof. I didn't say who is willing. That was the title deeds of the planet, you know. Didn't say who was willing. It said who is worthy. If, he, if he'd asked who is willing, there'd have been a stampede. John stood there. And all of a sudden, those high halls of heaven were shaken with a sob. They'd seen plenty of tears on earth, those angel hosts. They'd never seen tears in heaven. They stood and stared at John standing there with tears running down his cheeks for shame for the human race that of all the people that have lived on this planet, 
not a single one fit to govern the globe, not Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, not even David or Daniel, not Peter, James, or John, nobody. He said, I wept much. Then he was told to look. Behold, he said, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed, and there in the midst, well, where else would you find him? He's always in the midst. And the, the astounding thing is, John had just been looking at that throne. He'd just been looking at those four and twenty elders. He had just been looking at those four living creatures, and there in the midst of them all, he saw him. He turned to see the lion and looked straight into the face of the lamb. And you see the Lord Jesus go to the throne and put out that pierced hand to take possession of that which was rightfully his, to claim this little corner of the universe as token of the whole claim it. Have you ever wondered what he would have said if the one upon the throne had said to him, well, what is your right to these title deeds? Oh, I know what he would have said. He would have said, that world belongs to me by right of creation because I made it. That world belongs to me by right of Calvary. I bought it. Amen. That world belongs to me by right of conquest. For since the only language that the unregenerate heart of man seems to understand is the language that might is right, I'll go back and get it that way too. It's his. He created the universe. He controls the universe. He claims the universe. Let's close by restating that. Jesus Christ created you. <laughs> what an amazing thought. If you ever stop to think about it, you had absolutely no say whatsoever in the circumstances of your birth. Nobody asked you if you'd even like to be born. Nobody asked you if you'd like to be born into a poor family or a rich family. Nobody asked you if you'd like to be born in the United States of America or in the country where they speak the language properly. Nobody asked you. <laughs> Nobody asked you if you'd like to be born in this century or some other century. Nobody asked you anything. Jesus Christ created you. He knows all about you. He made you. He made you. And he claims you. Has every right to rule in your heart and mine as Savior and Lord. He claims us. We don't belong to ourselves. We've been bought with a price. We belong to him. He claims us. And he controls us. You know, if there's someone here this morning and you have not, not accepted Christ as your Savior, he controls you, you know. You don't have the last say. He does. He controls you. Oh, yes, you can say, I will or I won't, when you are presented with the gospel. You can say, I will. I will accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior from sin. You can do that. Or you can say, I won't. I won't get up and walk out and in effect tell the Lord Jesus keep your hands off my life leave me alone 
Well, that's your decision. But you don't have the last say. He does. And what will happen one of these days is simply this, that he will say to you, well, have it your own way. You didn't want me to be your Savior and your Lord. Well, have it your own way. Do without me forever. Jesus Christ created the universe. He controls the universe. He claims the universe. Hallelujah! What a Savior!